strategic pieces of work that we want to be thinking about as a committee to make recommendations to the incoming council, just to set a nice clean foundation, uh, recognising what they will be facing uh, in the next term. So I just wanted to plant that seed with the committee and we can pick that uh, conversation up and continue that conversation. Uh, so that brings us to item 4.1, confirmation of the previous minutes. The recommendation in front of us is that the Strategy and Policy Committee agrees that the minutes of the following meetings be confirmed as a true and correct record. 19th of October 2021, Strategy and Policy Committee meeting. 26th of October 2021, review of the 2019 speed limit bylaw hearing for the Mid-North. And the 2nd of November 2021, review of the 2019 speed limit bylaw hearing, Kaitaia. I'm happy to move that recommendation. Do I have a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Stratford, thank you. Do I have any comments or questions on these minutes? No, nothing? Fantastic. On that note, I will put it to the vote. So I am in support. Councillor Clendon. Aye. Uh, Malima, Deputy Mayor Court is with us today. Mayor Carter is not. So Deputy Mayor Court? In favour. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Foy. Favour. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Tepanea. In favour. Councillor Vucic. Aye. Member Ward. In favour. That is carried. Thank you, everybody. Item 5.1, litter infringement policy review. Uh, another great policy review in front of us. So the recommendation, the strategy and policy committee recommend to council uh, that council A, revoke the litter infringement policy 2017, B, adopt the provisions to infringe littering offences in the Far North District pursuant to section 13 of the Litter Act 1979, C, agree that no infringement fee shall exceed $400 as per section 13 of the Act, and D, agree infringement notices shall be served as per section 14 of the Act. Do I have a mover and a seconder to get this on the table, please? I'm happy to move. What's so up with Councillor Ford? Happy to second. Thank you. Uh, so, Darren, before we open to debate and questions, I'll give the floor over to you and your team for any opening comments on the report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, morning everybody um touching on your points this, this is this is another for me an, another piece of how we are rationalizing uh, our policies and bylaws and just making sure that we are fit for purpose um, i'd just like to acknowledge the work that caitlin thomas has done in bringing this report to us uh today she's done a lot of uh, research into the legislation and it's an old piece of legislation we go back to 1979 and when i was having a look through the legislation it made a uh, comment of appointing uh, traffic officers, which is something that we as territorial authorities no longer do. It now falls in the domain of the New Zealand Police. So, but back to, to litter, um, the report uh, lays out the processes that have been considered. The fact that we have legislation that allows us to directly issue infringements through that as opposed to having policy. And so the recommendations before you uh, adjust in the revocation. So, um, Caitlin, I'll, I'll pass to you if there's anything that you'd like to add, as this is this is a lot of work in your paper. With just on mute. Oh dear, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, through the chair, revoking the policy and adopting a resolution as per section 13 of the Litter Act is best practice. It's more streamlined with legislation and the policy is not necessary. It's a little bit of overkill of what section 13 actually states. If there was evidence that the policy was being utilised, we could consider keeping it, but it's just another document that we don't need and therefore it would be best to follow as the Act states. We don't need the policy to achieve the outcomes of the Litter Act and considering the resolution being more streamlined with the Act, this is a much tidier way to approach controlling um, litter in the district. Thank you. 
Thank you for those opening statements, uh, Darren and Caitlin. Councillor Foy, as seconder of the motion, would you like to make comments or ask questions? And then I have Deputy Mayor Court. Uh, thank you. I had one question. It was about the amount of the fine. Uh, I'm not sure the definition of littering when compared to illegal dumping. Uh, I'm aware that uh, particularly what I've seen is large amounts of illegal dumping and $400 is not a lot of money to try and deter that. Um, is it, can the staff give commentary around why it's up to $400 and what instruments there might be about, for example, large scale illegal dumping? Yes, so as per section 13 of the Litter Act, part four, it states that no infringement fee shall exceed $400, which is where that number came from. Um, thanks for that, Caitlin. In terms of the definition of littering versus illegal dumping, I'm aware that like monitoring, monitor people that, you know, put rubbish, big rubbish bags and beds and, um, huge amounts of not just litter, but dump loads. Um, is there something around the definition of littering as compared to illegal dumping? Um, littering, the definition as per section two of the Act includes any refuse, rubbish, animal remains, glass, metal, garbage, debris, dirt, filth, rubble, ballast, stones, earth, waste or matter or anything of the nature. So it's quite a broad definition. Thank you. Is for there that. any reference there to volume? No. Thank you for that, Caitlin. Uh, Deputy Mayor Court, and then I have David Clendon, Councillor of Usage, and Councillor Tepanea. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is a process question, and it relates to that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommend to Council. I'm mindful that. Um, on the purple pages, it talks about the scope of this committee leading the development and review of Council's policies and district bylaws when and as directed to by Council and recommend to Council new or amended bylaws for adoption. We're not recommending a new bylaw for adoption. We're actually looking to align to the Litter Act 1979 we're not looking to amend the bylaw. And the reason I'm asking this question is that my colleagues will be aware the order paper for December was so significant that it has now been determined to hold council meeting over two separate days instead of one. And I'm worried about constantly duplicating workload and whether or not this needs to go to council or whether it can be resolved at this level. Um, and if it has to go to council, perhaps it's timely to have a re rethink about uh, some of the delegations that sit at committee level so we can become more efficient. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. Do we have a response from Democracy Services on that, please? Thank you for that, Aisha. Deputy Mayor Court, does that satisfy you at this point? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I do appreciate that. I've broadsided everybody with that, but I am trying to get us on a more efficient footing. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pick that up outside of this meeting and make sure that that's picked up before December. Uh, Councillor Clendon. Yeah, thank you. I just wonder if, um, in addition to charging a $400 fine effectively, can we still, under the legislation, claim back um, clean-up charges? If we can identify who's throwing a trailer load of rubbish down the bank, can we still hit them for the cost of their clean-up? Thank you. Uh, through, through you, Madam Chair. Um, Section 21 of the Litter Act um, makes reference to the cost of removing litter. So upon conviction, uh, that can be recovered. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Yes, I, I had a note to myself to go and read the act, but um, good intentions didn't always carry through. So thanks for that. So we can still recover that cost if need be. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Clendon. Councillor Vesich. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had similar questions that um, Councillor Court had. The um, and it relates to you. You're actually revoking a policy, which means it has to go to council. We govern through policy, so we have no choice but to do that, which is great, because uh, all parties should be involved in that. Um, the question I have, therefore, relates to that, and that is, does the Act have appropriate guidance to staff on all matters regarding littering for us up here? So. Um, I think it does, from what I understand. And then the other question is, uh, does, and it's probably for Will or whoever, uh, or no, sorry, or maybe Darren, is is there a process manual in existence that gives the detailed operation instructions to staff? Sure, thank you. Um, first question, the, the Legislation is the backbone um, for any regulatory framework. So I, I, I have, I'm, I'm comfortable with the revocation of the policy, and as outlined in the report, it does duplicate the legislation. The section 13 is, is pretty clear in, in what that allows us to do. Um, I'm Councillor Vesich. I, I might defer to Dean Myberg. Um, for the second question, uh, is that something that would be delivered through our monitoring arm? I'm, I'm sure there's guidelines and standard operating procedures, and I do note that they do issue a number of infringement notices. But, but rather than um, than talk out of out of place, I think maybe Dean is better placed to answer that one. Thank you, Darren. Um, as far as the procedures or manuals are concerned. Um, there's a bit of crossover between infrastructure, asset management and the contractors who uh, do the solid waste um, contracts. <coughs> so it is something we will follow through on because I cannot answer that for you unless Andy's on the line, I'm not sure if he is, um, to uh, ensure that consistency of process between our compliance officers and the people who actually are out there doing the contracts, because the onus of proof is 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 on us pretty much of finding out by rifling through those bags if they are bags and finding any evidence of who may have dumped there. If it's a bed or concrete uh, building material, etc., it's very hard to trace that unless members of the public who might issue um, or lodge an RFS uh, request for service complaint have photographic evidence of a license plate or something like that when the when the dumping actually occurred. So what I'm flagging is long winded answer to, a, to the question, but um, I think we need further work in this area. We've spoken at length in the past about multi-warranting uh, of, of officers uh, out in the field so that any officer who observes something like this may be able to deal to that situation when when and if they come across it. Uh, so d different aspects and, as uh, and facets to this. I don't think it lies entirely with the compliance um, officers because we just don't have enough of them. It is a united effort between them the contractors who are finding the litter or the bags that have been uh, dumped somewhere. And so, so I, I don't think we have one manual or one process manual that covers all of that. So there, there would probably be a big gap and it's something I will follow yeah. up with, with Andy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dean. I was just really, uh, you know, really concerned that we have procedure manuals in place it's not fair on staff or our contractors to interpret an act. So we have that there covering that, uh, then that's fine. Um, I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vucic. Uh, I noticed that Andy Finch popped his hand up, but he's taken it down again. So Andy, if you're happy to leave that, uh, unless yeah, if you want any comment. No, I think um, if, if Councillor Vucic is happy to, to to leave that, we'll work with Dean. I think just uh, just for information, the IM business report does give some stats every month on um, illegal dumping volumes, and I can confirm our contractors do, where they encounter um, illegal dumping, they do search through uh, trying to identify the source of that dumping. Thank you for that, Andy. Uh, Councillor Tipania. 
Uh, kia ora. Thank you, um, Chair Smith. Um, well, my colleagues asked all the questions I wanted to ask. Um, I guess for me, it was just um, on the radio yesterday when I talked about our agenda for today's committee meeting, I just said, you know, for the public to, to understand that if this does get revoked, this litter infringement policy, it doesn't, of course, mean that we won't be penalising those in our district because, man, if there are you know, two things that I hear most about as a councillor, it's like speeding in our streets and it's littering or um, fly tipping and all of that. So just to make sure that we get that wording out that this is being revoked because there's already a mechanism within our uh, council that will allow us to still ping those um, people who aren't following the proper rules. So kia ora. Thank you, Councillor Tipania. I don't see any further hands up at this point, and I've had all of my questions satisfied. Thank you, colleagues. So at this point, I'm, I'm comfortable to put this to the vote. So the recommendation in front of us, which I read at the beginning of the agenda item, uh, that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommend uh, A, B, C and D to Council in regards to the Litter Infringement Policy 2017. I am in favour, Councillor Clendon, in favour. Deputy Mayor Court. In favour. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Foy. Favour. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Tepanier. In favour. Councillor Vucic. Aye. Member Ward. In favour. And that is carried. Malima, just a point of note, I'm not sure if it's my screen, but that is coming through really uh, blurry. It was quite hard to read there. So just for the benefit of our YouTube viewers, perhaps you could pick that up for later. That would be great. Okay. Uh, so that brings us to item 5.2, solid waste bylaw recommendation to continue bylaw. The recommendation in front of us that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommends that the Council A agree in response to the consultation under 163B2, no amendments are to be made to the Solid Waste Bylaw, and B agree under Section 160 of the Local Government Act 2002 that the Solid Waste Bylaw be continued without amendment. Do I have a mover for that, please? Happy to move. Who was that, sorry? Felicity. Councillor Foy, thank you. Do I have a seconder, please? Kelly. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Uh, Darren, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and on the back of the good boiler and policy work that we've seen coming out of the team, this is the next iteration, um, which really gives us some clarity around what it is that we're doing with solid waste in, in that bylaw. Um, the, the recommendations are clear. We've, we went out to consult, we had 18 submissions, uh, 16 of those submissions were in support of uh, the recommendation. The, the, the caveat that we have here, which is in the body of the report, is that the bylaw is fit for purpose for now uh, and further review will take place in 2023 when the waste management and minimisation plan review uh, uh, looks to take place. So I, um, I see Briar is with us today, so um, welcome Briar as the re report writer. Is there anything that you'd like to add? You're just on mute. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Darren. That's, that's uh, all of my points as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Darren and Briar. Councillor Foy, as mover, have you got any questions or comments you'd like to make at this point? No, I think the report's really clear and concise. Thanks um, to the start for that. Thank you, Councillor Foy. Councillor Stratford, a seconder. Uh, yeah, I just want to um, acknowledge the people that did put in submissions and I think we only had one person. I can't remember now, but um, the submitter that opposed that I can recall, um, yeah, I think the majority of the population this suits, especially when looking at our waste minimisation plan and the fact that, you know, we're not, 
we're not here to enable rubbish. We're here to um, minimise waste and collect, uh, you know, enable uh, at events and stuff. That was the issue that was raised. Make sure that there is waste minimisation encompassed in there. So, yeah, I'm really happy with the bylaw as it stands. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Councillor Vucich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a question again. I, I realise that the government is certainly looking at the minimisation of waste, and it's also part of the um, climate change issues. I, as I read this, there is no, going to be no impact on what the government wishes to achieve. Well, it can't, obviously. But so, do we have an opportunity? Rather, can we front foot it rather than waiting until uh, the government? It's got its minimisation plan, say through through the in 2023. I presume there's nothing stopping us having a look in uh, at our policies before that, to so that we can align quickly in the process, because we will have that commitment on us. Roger, I see you've set forward this. So I'm wondering if you have something that you'd like to add before, Brian. Um, through the chair, um, if that's a direction that the committee wants to give us um, to back to council, then there's no reason we couldn't um, bring that forward. Um, we know that the 2023 data is rolling around and we are aware of legislation changing, but this paper was put forward on that premise that um, that's the approach we're, we're taking as a council. Um, but if the direction wants to be given to staff to do something in that space, um, I am also aware that there's some regional initiatives going on in this space as well, coming out of, I think, is out of North and Fort together. Um, again, um, I'm not exactly across what is happening there, um, but that could also be a bit of a driver for, for bringing this thing forward. But again, it would be a direction given to the staff to, to do that. I'd probably, from me, my other colleagues may wish to comment, as long as we can pick it up at any time, and I presume we can, um, I'm happy to leave it as it is. Um, I'm aware of those other initiatives there, thanks, uh, Roger. And that's, you know, that's part of the overall picture that I'm thinking of to be consistent with the government legislation and other initiatives that are actually happening. Um, I presume, and that was my question, we can pick it, pick this up at any time. Uh, should it be, you know, should it be warranted? Thank you, Councillor Vucic. Just for clarity, you're not seeking an amendment of any sort at this time? No, not me personally, uh, but other colleagues may, may say something differently. I'm, I'm quite happy because I believe, and no one really said an answer to that, that we can pick this up at any time and change it as is, as is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vucic. Member Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, mine was following on actually from um, Councillor Vucic as to the, the time frame and how quickly it will come around, bearing in mind we have elections next year and how the council is capturing the issues for when we come to reassess this. Uh, just picking up, there's a number of things that, that concern me within the existing policy and bearing in mind we're doing a district plan as well and looking at um, res the resource consent con side, of ap side of applications. Um, just taking a few examples here, like the multi-unit development side of it, for example, um, when, re when resource consents are applied for, um, the design and access of the waste minimisation areas and the issues that are created within those areas within the development um, are not, that there doesn't seem to be enough uh, focus and weight put on the practical physical side from the planning perspective. I know Greg might be sitting on this and might have something to say about it, but when they talk about, um, you know, providing adequate, what what is adequate? Uh, we've got examples here of um, very small areas where you can't really recycle and in large developments, particularly urban issue, are an issue because the big trucks can't access underneath the buildings. Therefore, all the rubbish gets brought out and gets put onto the pavements and becomes a odour issue in the summertime. There's quite a few issues surrounding 
waste and I feel that there's areas where we could do a lot better. So I just want to capture, I want some, I guess, um, reassurance that we're going to be capturing some of the issues moving forward. Likewise, around charges and the fact that if we're encouraging um, waste minimisation, you know, I've brought this up in workshops before, why do we actually... Um, why is it cheaper to put out a, a, a wheelie bin in Kitty Kitty urban area and just jam it with everything than to put out your recycle bins? Um, we have to look at affordability moving forward. Uh, and events, um, many a time um, they're held on reserves. And as you know, our reserves are smoke-free, vape-free, alcohol-free. And we go and do a check after big events. And quite often there's many cigarette butts. There's many tear tabs, um, not all off um, non-alcoholic drinks and things so we actually do monitor and get the event organizing council to go back to them and say hey you need to do another sweep it's not good enough but my question is in the first instance is why are they doing these activities on our reserves so I do have a number of issues there that concern me and I guess the latest one which I had a chuckle over um, and Councillor Smith uh, was involved in that one is the um, TIF funding the smart bins, we've been really fortunate to get four for Pai here, three for Russell, and I think there's a surplus for another two or three in the area. They compact the rubbish. Smart, eh? And we support, and government's putting out these smart bins. So I just, I don't want to be that negative person in the room all the time, but how forward thinking are we? Because something that's free is not necessarily always cheap and easy. They could be very high maintenance. Um, yes, they'll reduce the rubbish, but if they're Wi-Fi dependent, that could be an issue as well. They're going to look really pretty because they're wrapped with beautiful um, scenes of the Bay of Islands aerial photographs that I chose and Manuela chose, but just chucking that in the mix. Um, cost versus practicality versus thinking outside the square and not making rushed decisions on grabbing that stuff just because we think it's subsidised or free. So I would like to see... Um, yeah, some way of capturing our issues between now and 2023 because it's going to come around really quickly and most of us probably won't be there. So we need to have something moving forward for staff and public to work with. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. If I can just jump in before any staff response, I think what you're highlighting is exactly the same sort of points as what Council of Usage is raising is that this is specific to the bylaw. This is the what can't people do, but we do need to take a more strategic approach and a big picture approach leading into 2023 uh, and how we deal with that. Uh, just planting a wee gem that I learnt last week with the committee, we are the only council in New Zealand that doesn't subsidise curbside uh, refuge, refuse collection. Uh, so planted the seed leading into the next LTP. But Darren, if your staff have got responses, that would be great. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, I think really good points there from uh, Member Warden. Thanks for, for your for your response, um, leading into 2023, when the when the let's call it a, a comprehensive review and falling out on the coming on the back of what lenses were provided through central government, I'm I'm confident that that will give us the ability to come back to council uh, with something that is comprehensive. If I come back to the intention of today, it, it really was about maintaining the status quo as we lead into 2023. Um, but between now and then, um, I'm sure there is a lot of opportunity for us to start to build that information platform so that we are well placed when this is um, uh, reviewed uh, comprehensively. R Roger, is there anything, or Briar, is there anything that you'd, you'd like to add to that? I'd just uh, like to let everybody know that we are starting work on the uh, solid waste strategic direction so and that includes reviewing the waste minimization and management plan and um, so there is a working group that has already been established and so the first step obviously will be to gather some data and undertake um, community engagement and then we will be able to go from there with potential solutions Thank you, Darren and Briar. I have Councillor Tepania. Um, kia ora. Oh, I um, 
again, my colleagues picked up on most of my um, kind of concerns. If I could just um, support what Councillor Vucic was saying, though, around the fact that we we should be able to pick this up at any time. I also know that we'll be getting a paper across Council um, following that workshop and the discussions around the um, regional regionalization of refuse in that that we are potentially looking at um, further staffing in this space for our team that looks after this so um, with that will become uh, more capacity within our council to be able to actually review things like this and to keep up to play with what's going on so um yeah that was my five cents thank you Thank you, Councillor Tipanea. I don't see any other uh, hands. I just had a quick question. Uh, apologies, Councillor Collard. Yeah, ju just a, a quick one, a, a sort of um, a little bit of clarity for myself in terms of what uh, Member Ward was talking about in terms of smart bins and compactors. Would that negate any recycling if they, if if smart bins became um, a, a large item in our region, would that negate any recycling facility because all of those bins are compacted already? Quite, thanks very much, Councillor Collard. That's, that's a really good question. I, I might defer to, um, to Andy Finch if he's here. I am, um, through the chair, um, good question. Anything put in a refuse bin is taken to landfill. It is not sorted before landfill. So if if council wish to have separate um, refuse bins or bins for recycling, then that would need to be a separate on street provision. Thank you. Just uh, if I could just add to that, we we currently. I know in the streets of Kaitaia have recycle bins on the street and waste bins. So there is some area there where, where it is catered to. Thank you, Councillor Collard. Uh, I just had a quick question, Darren, just in terms of especially the points that Councillor Vucic has raised. Are you able to confirm the report notes uh, that the waste management and minimisation plan for FNDC review is due by 2023? Are you able just to confirm with the committee where that is in the work programme currently so that the committee can turn their minds to whether or not that they feel that is fit for purpose? Sure, thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. I, I might ask uh, Roger to to come in on that one for me, if he, if, if I could. Yeah, uh, just through the chair, just um just reiterating what um, Bryce said, we, we we started the process of thinking about that. So um for us, it's just to you know we are working towards that time frame. Um and but we do need to go through that um that process that we've got our policy instruments um, development process to to make sure we do it properly. Starting with identifying, um, you know, our key partners and stakeholders, um, and you know, doing some good public consultation on this here. So, um, but we have identified it, um, and we just need to get moving on that thing there. But that's the time frame we're working towards at the moment, um, as per um, what's in the report. Brian, do you want any, anything? I think it's pretty much uh, just one. The waste management minimisation plan requires audits. So those are also need to kick off as well. Thank you for that. That's really useful. So I don't have any further hands at this point. We have a recommendation in front of us that the Strategy and Policy Committee recommends that the Council A, agree in response to the consultation under 163B2, no amendments are to be made to the Solid Waste Bylaw, and B, agree under Section 160 of the Local Government Act 2002, the Solid Waste Bylaw will be continued without amendment, and just noting that uh, this will be picked up again as part of the 2023 strategic piece of work. So I am in favour of the recommendation, and Councillor Clendon. Aye. Deputy Mayor Court? Aye. Councillor Collard? In favour. Councillor Foy? Favour. Councillor Stratford? Aye. Councillor Tepanea? Aye. Councillor Vucic? Aye. Member Ward? Aye. That is carried. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Briar, for another fantastic uh, bylaw paper. So that brings us to item 6.1.
the Regional Accessibility Strategy, a very exciting piece of work. Uh, this is an information report, so we're simply, uh, the recommendation is simply to receive the report, Regional Accessibility Strategy. Do I have a mover for that, please? I'll move. Councillor Stratford, a second, please. I'll second. Councillor Collard, thank you. Darren, the floor is yours. Hey, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I'll take the report as being read. This is this is a, a, a really um, feel good story for us. It's about how we are collaborating across the region to come up with something that is really smart and, and, and recognising accessibility uh, across the region. You know, we, we at times we might see um, policy done in isolation and strategy the same. So so for me, this is about how we're collaborating and I'm really pleased uh, that we see this and into the first part of 22. Uh, there will be further work being done. Uh, uh, again, congratulations to Caitlin for the way that you've put this report together and the work that you've been doing in this space. So, uh, Caitlin, is there anything that you would like to add? Thank you, Darren. Um, through the chair, obviously, since this is information only, this is largely a heads up to you all as elected members to know what is coming in this area. It's particularly relevant to Northland. We have a comparatively high percentage of individuals who identify as having a disability compared to the national population. While we do follow as a council the legislative requirements for accessibility, there is evidence that this is not enough to guarantee equal access to everyone in the community. This has been recognised by central government for example, in a Ministry of Business Office for Disability Issues report on the built environment that did conclude that the Building Act, for example, isn't enough to guarantee everyone to have access to the built environment. There is a body of work that is being developed at the moment on accelerating accessibility. The policy framework was expected to reach Cabinet in September, but we are still waiting on that. It's frankly a brilliant opportunity for Council to do more. This aligns with the Section 10 of the Local Government Act and is important for improving community wellbeing. I'd also really like to highlight to the committee that access is not an issue that is exclusive to people with disabilities. It's relevant to the whole community, including parents with small children, elderly individuals, and the wider community benefits from improved access. People being able to travel safely in order to access social situations, people being able to access shops and buildings and work. This is something that will, once we put forward more for the strategy, really improve the well-being for everyone in the wider community. And I think it's something that we should all be aspiring to do better on. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin, a fantastic summary. And I think you've got us all overly excited. It is a fantastic piece of work and thank you for leading this. Uh, Councillor Stratford, as the mover, would you like to open with comments or questions? And then Councillor Collard. Yeah, I've just got a, a few comments. I just want to acknowledge um, Caitlin's work on not just um, part of the strategy, the policy um, update that she's been working on since I think 2018 or so with the Disability Action Group in the far north. And um, also just really acknowledge her passion and also, um, you know, really bringing to your attention colleagues and anybody, you know, as members of the public, um, the issues that um, people with disabilities can face and the role that council plays. We all have a role to play in enabling people with disabilities to be able to participate in society. And uh, I'm, not, I'm, got, I'm not gonna steal Deputy Mayor Ann Court's thunder, but I, I do wanna mention that, um, Council can't be at every single mobility car park space. So whilst this is outside the um, scope of this, I just, you know, really everyone has a role to play in, um, you know, 
helping people with disabilities be able to function as fully, fully, you know, fully participate in um, our, our community. And when you park in one of their car parks, it makes them have to walk, you know, another 10, 15 minutes when somebody's got um, a, a hip that's been done or, you know, concussion symptoms or recovering from stroke. Um, you, you're just impacting on their ability to cope with life um, further. Um, yeah, so again, thank you for your passion, Caitlin. I'll see you hopefully at the next DAG meeting and hopefully it's not postponed again. Namahi. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Councillor Collard. Uh, I have nothing further to add except the support for um, what uh, Kelly has just said and the praise the work the, of Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collard. Councillor Vesich. I do have a specific question, uh, Madam Chair. I um, appreciate all the work, by the way, that's been done. Uh, but, by Caitlin, you said there's an opportunity to do more. And this question is really around the funding that we have put in the long term plan to allow this to actually happen. I'm a person with a disability myself and, um, you know, appreciate all of this. How 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 well are you funded enough to do more? The fundings and the specifics are all going to be identified further. So you will receive an options paper that will elaborate and be able to answer all of these questions. The purpose of this paper is mostly to inform you that this is in development and we are looking into these things. And obviously funding is one of the most significant impactors into how we can achieve the best deliverables to our communities. So I hope that the next paper with the specifics will be able to give you a very clear idea of that, Councillor Vucic. Councillor Vucic, are you happy at this point? Um, I'm happy with that, that answer, but it's probably, it's really about, is there long-term plan funding set aside? That's probably not, not something that Caitlin um, should be answering, um, but we'll leave that for later. Thanks. There Thanks. is a number set aside as part of the, I'll be able to give you a direct quote in one second. Council has a commitment to the accessibility strategy as per the community outcome of the long-term plan of communities that are healthy and safe and connected and sustainable, communities that have access to everything they need for a good quality of life. And I think, Roger, you were leaning forward, you know about the number you'd like to... No, just that um, there's a budget commitment to, um, we've, we've committed money into um, with WDC um, so that's gone through to develop the strategy, but I guess um, the question um, is um, out of that strategy development is obviously kind of come an implementation plan. It'll be what are we committing to um, in the way of um, you know, actually doing things on the ground? So um, fixing, making footpaths wider, um, having um, accessibility into buildings as Catlin was talking about. So that would be an outcome of that. And obviously, um, you know, there's some things we need to do better, as Catelyn said, and also to, com to comply with legislation. So I would expect that the strategy would have to address um, those um, those matters. Thank you. Well, maybe, Madam Chair. Thank you, Roger and Caitlin. Thank you, Councillor of Research. Deputy Mayor Court. Thank you, Madam Chair. I note on page 55 of the agenda, Cabinet approved a work program for accel accelerating accessibility in Aotearoa. On 28th of July, Cabinet Social Wellbeing Committee agreed to a draft accessibility legislative framework. However, this has not progressed. I think there's an opportunity here for us to, to lobby the Crown. And why am I saying that? we can write a disability strategy that will address things that are within our purview. So we can look to the Canberra footpaths, accessibility to council owned buildings, accessibility to public toilets and things like that. But what we can't do is we can't 
direct changes to the Building Act or the Resource Management Act through our policy. And we know it's dopey. And we know it's dopey and you only need to look at the John Butler Centre to know that it's dopey. So that building complies with the Building Act and it complies with disability standards. And I would challenge anybody in a wheelchair to get into the JBC, get to the third floor and then get out in the event of a fire because the first thing that happens is the lift shuts down and they have to exit through that external staircase. It's dopey. So we can go a certain length with our strategy, but we're missing a real opportunity here to, to lobby the Crown and get involved in that Cabinet social wellbeing think piece. So I'm just going to challenge us a little bit to think a bit bigger than what we can do in the Far North District. We, some years ago, worked with an organisation called Barrier Free. I hope you all have heard of them. They are an amazing organisation. They came up to the far north. They put us all in wheelchairs and challenged us to, to get around Kaikaui. None of us could. They gave us special glasses to wear that imitated being blind and challenged us just to get around chambers. I don't think any of us could. These people have hands-on practical knowledge on what it's like to live in a disabled world and can add really valuable insights for us. So when I looked at um, the regional, the section on the regional access, accessibility strategy, I didn't see any of the real stakeholders listed there. I see staff, and that's great, but I think we need to increase our scope. Um, on the next stages, um, on page 56, where it talks about discussion and next steps, is if we're going to do this and do this well and do it meaningfully, to really make a difference for what it's like to live in an able-bodied world when you're not an able-bodied person. We need to make sure that we take people like Barrier Free with us on the journey right from the beginning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. I'm not sure, Darren, if anyone from your team has any response to the Deputy Mayor on any of those points raised. Thank you. I, I see Caitlin has her hand up, and, and Caitlin, just, just before, um, I, I do note that, that the, the government in acknowledging um, the, the work that needs to be done, and on the back of, I think, the, the, the reforms that we're seeing in health have announced that there will be a new Ministry for Disabled People, which comes into play in July of 2022, um, and I certainly hope that that is a vehicle for leading the change. So it's um, perhaps something for the Deputy Mayor who may already be aware of that. Um, and then, Caitlin, you had some specifics that you wanted to add. Uh, Deputy Mayor Court, you are absolutely right. We can't, as staff, take something to the disability community saying, this is what we think you want. It's a strategy that intends to include the perspectives and voices of people with lived experience throughout the process. Again, this is at the earliest stages, but we have identified a large chart of stakeholders and partners, including different elderly people groups, Deaf Aotearoa, Blind Foundation, Total Mobility, our wonderful Far North Disability Action Group. There is a larger body of stuff going on behind the scenes as we gear up to actually progressing the strategy. And I thank you for reminding us of the need for that. Thank you for that, Caitlin. And Deputy Mayor Court, if uh, formal lobbying is something that you would like to pick up, uh, happy to pick up that conversation with you outside of this meeting as to how we might like to do that. Uh, Councillor Clendon and then Councillor Foy. Yeah, thank you. Um, you're not pushing to labour the point, but it is true that while we have assigned funding for a policy, at the point we start to implement a policy or strategy, there could be quite big dollars attached to that. And that's something we just have to accept that reality. Um, I'm sure any one of us could point to footpaths or other areas that are unsafe for somebody in a wheelchair or somebody who's sight impaired. Um, even things like better 
monitoring and forcing compliance with our El Fresco dining and signage. I'm just thinking about that corner of Kitty Kitty Road and Cobham, you know, outside Zest and Salt. It can be hard enough navigating your way through there when you're fully mobile and good sight, let alone somebody who's none of those things. But there will be a significant bill attached, and that's money. I mean, I don't have a problem with that. It's simply money we have to spend, but we do have to be alert to it. I think there's an upside to this as well, and it was briefly mentioned in that presentation we had. Access tourism is a real thing. I was involved in tourism quite heavily as an MP. I forget the number, but internationally, and this was pre-COVID admittedly, the value of access tourism was in many, many billions of dollars. And New Zealand didn't get much of that because we don't sell ourselves as a good destination. We encourage people to come to New Zealand and hurl themselves off a bridge in Queenstown. Um, an elderly person, somebody in a chair, somebody who's sight impaired, doesn't want to do that, but it doesn't mean they want to sit at home either. So to the extent that we can work with the public sector, I'm sorry, the private sector, our accommodation providers, cafes, all of that, if we can encourage them to make their places um, accessible, and if we make our public spaces accessible, that's actually a commercial advantage if we get real about that. So just highlighting as well as a cost to this, there is potentially an upside as well, an economic benefit. And I think we ought not to lose sight of that. Um, a long-winded way of saying, yeah, I support the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Clendon. And I think your points around accessibility tourism, especially, perhaps is something that yourself and Councillor Vucic may also like to pick up as part of the Northland Inc. work stream, as that statement of intent is written, as to how Northland can ensure that it's an accessible region for people outside of the everyday uh, community members. Councillor Foy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for the great report, Caitlin. Um, I note uh, in the next steps, and Councillor Cleanland did touch on this, about the implementation. Um, it's great we're writing a strategy, but how are we going to implement that strategy? Or is, are we just going to have a strategy on a shelf that's utopian uh, and that's not going to result in positive outcomes? Because... As uh, Councillor Court has highlighted, we don't have control of the Building Code or the Building Act. We don't have control over people building private buildings. But what we do have control over is our open spaces, our engineering standards, our renewals program for all of our footpaths, our open spaces design and having an urban design approach and urban design um, protocols is part of our planning. And one of those um, concepts, principles of urban design is being collaborative and being inclusive. Uh, and we did that with JC Park. We have a wheelchair um, swing as part of our design and all of our paths are now made 2.2 meters wide and the gradients of those paths allow for uh, people with disabilities. So further for that, the placing of bollards, et cetera. So if we don't have an implementation plan then we will end up with our fresco dining policies that don't align with it. You know, our new district plan won't have policies and objectives to encourage those outcomes. Um, so I, although I've been told that Greg is part of the group, I think, the disability action meetings, I think, Greg um, Wilson, our manager of district plan, which is great. I would like to see someone from our infrastructure team who's an engineer or a project manager that delivers all of our physical projects for council to be part of that group because it's the engineers and the doing people of council that decide the physical outcomes that the community sees. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't read the strategies every day, um, but if we make it part of their everyday well-being and that they know about it, maybe get them in, in the wheelchairs, get the engineers in the wheelchairs and wear the glasses. Um, so that they can have an understanding of how that works and when they implement all of their physical projects, that they are ensuring that those renewals comply, that our open spaces comply, um, and that any renewals funding we are spending is resulting in those outcomes we're trying to achieve. Um, so on page, whatever it is, 50, 56. Um, next steps, can we include an implementation plan for that strategy as well? Mm. 
Thanks, Councillor Foy. Um, I'm quite happy to take uh, those requests on board. And, and noting that as we as we work through the consultation and identify the issues, um, those will all be guiding principles for the action plan through the strategy. Um, thank you for that, Darren. And just note any strategy that our council makes, there's no point in having the strategy unless there's an implementation plan and money and staff that are uh, upskilled to ensure that those are given fair to. Thank you, Councillor Foy. And as chair of the Infrastructure Committee, this is highlighting uh, the benefit of having cross committee work streams. So I look forward to you picking that up at your committee level as well. Uh, Councillor Stratford and Councillor Ward, I both note that you have your hands up. Uh, Councillor Stratford, if you could keep it brief, and Member Ward, I note that you haven't spoken yet, so I will take you after Councillor Stratford. I'm happy to take the closing since I was opening. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Stratford. Uh, Member Ward. Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Mine's um, around Felicity's point of um, implementation. Um, under community board delegations, uh, one of our delegations is to recommend new bylaws and um, amendments to existing bylaws, which we do do. The problem is no budget and implementation. And Councillor Stratford will recall probably two years ago, um, they came to the community board um, asking for um, an update on our disability parking. Parking's the main issue. Uh, and of course, access around our uh, footpath areas. And um, we're still waiting for the implementation of those car parks. And in the meantime, uh, businesses have shifted, closed. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a real need for um, constant uh, revisiting at community board level and updating our recommendations to council in relation to the shifting and changing of development and businesses and activity within townships, particularly urban areas. If your post office moves, if your chemist moves, um, that can have a huge impact on the flow and the need uh, for disability people to, to have you know, good, ready, ac available access to those facilities um, for parking um, for their needs. So that was my first point. So without the budget, without we keep getting told there's no money, which is ridiculous. The second thing, Darren, you'll remember this from your previous days at council. Every summer, the beginning of every summer, council used to do a signage sandwich board sweep around the urban areas of the town. I see Deputy Mayor Court grinning there. That hasn't happened since um, for a few years now, since since departure of um, the dear gentleman back to the UK, who used to to um, lead that, that and and you know it was fabulous. It cleared our footpaths of clutter. Um, you'd be surprised how many signs weren't reclaimed, which just goes to show that perhaps some of them, you know, were just sitting there permanently. Um, can I just please implore that monitoring, start that simple little exercise up again. Um, I know it needs resources, but it actually doesn't take a lot of time to do. And the results and the outcome are um, golden for our communities in summertime. So thank you. Thanks, Member Ward. Um, and I, Dean Myberg is, is with us today, so I'm sure he's taken those comments on board. And we have received photos from our chair identifying some hotspots in Kitty Kitty as well of Savage Board. So I uh, appreciate the community input. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. And I would just like to take the opportunity to commend Dr. Myberg and his team for the response in that space, uh, following requests from the disability community. Dr. Myberg, I know you've got your hand up. Did you want to make comment? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just briefly, um, yes, we we just need to differentiate between the ability to proactively do that, and it's a great suggestion from Member Ward, but. Um, we tend to focus on hotspots and where there are particular issues. So we've just done that recently in Kerry Kerry following uh, complaints. So um, yeah, it's something we'll strive to do, but I can't promise that we can proactively right across this district do sandwich board sweeps. Um, that might be a challenge for us, but we certainly will respond where there are issues identified. Thank you, Dr. Myberg. Uh, Councillor Stratford, the floor is yours for closing comments. Awesome, thanks very much. Um, oh my God, I forgot what I was gonna say, shit, oops. 
that was really important. Oh, in response to Councillor Foy, um, so when we get a really good turnout, so this is for the GMs, we have had somebody from Roading who listens to all the um, issues raised from um, people that are in mobility scooters about footpaths. Uh, we have somebody from district facilities who listens to the concerns about pathways on our reserves and, um, you know, inaccessibility to toilets and um, wanting another swing. Um, who else do we have? Um, we have the lovely Caitlin. And also, um, like I said yesterday in our workshop where we were able to hear more about this disability strategy, um, we also have um, the district plan staff there as well. So I hope that that, um, you know, I just want to make sure that one, your concerns are um, appeased, Councillor Foy, but also um, please, you know, GMs, make sure that as you know, because there, there has been a change in staff in the NTA, please make sure that the new person um, knows to come to the DAG meeting, knows to come with ears wide open and um, with lots of good, um, you know, well printed tactile information for people because some of them can't hear. Um, yeah, just, yeah, they're there and uh, our disability action group is really well functioning. The th only thing that lets down the disability action group is the implementation of some of the things that they um, want to see happen. Kia ora. Kia ora, Councillor Stratford. So that brings us to the end of this item, the recommendation that the Strategy and Policy Committee receive the report Regional Accessibility Strategy moved by Councillor Stratford, seconded by Councillor Collard. I am in favour, Councillor Clendon. Deputy Mayor Court. In favour. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Foy. In favour. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Tepania? In favour. Councillor Vucic? Aye. Member Ward? Aye. Councillor Clendon, are you with us? Yes, in favour. Sorry, my name is Button Morris and Mr. Davey. No problems. Thank you. So that is carried. Thank you, everybody. Uh, item 6.2 Completion Wait. of the draft district plan and timetable for notification. The recommendation that the strategy and policy committee receive the report completion of the draft district plan and timetable for notification. I understand, Councillor Vucic, you were wanting to move? Yeah, I'm happy to move, Madam. Councillor Foy seconded. Thank you. Uh, Darren, the floor is yours. Thanks, Madam Chair. <laughs> I'm going to take that as a good thing. This is um, this is really timely, um, and I'm 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 really pleased that we're able to bring this update to you uh, today. As we're aware, the DP has been um, in development since 2016. Uh, we're now in approaching the end of 2021, uh, and between now and then, there has been a lot of movement. We've seen a, a lot in the reform space. It's really starting to to crowd. Um, I think what is already a crowded space uh, and sector reforms seem to be never ending. Um, but coming through that, uh, we have a date where we are looking to propose. Uh, Greg and his team is working very, very hard to achieve this date uh, and working with MFE and, and, and colleagues across the region. There seems to be a lot of discussion and debate around the region as we look to give effect to those higher order policies and statements um, which are proving uh, challenging. Um, so, so Greg, uh, by way of introduction, if I can uh, pass to you for any further comment. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if I could just give a brief characterisation of um, of the information report that we've put forward um, and some of the um, the things that we um, have done, are continuing to do, and um, and how when we want to bring the plan for Council's authorisation for notification. Um, so it's been a pretty full on year um, and we appreciate everything that um, our elected members have done to work with us and support us in the development of a, um, a new district plan. 
Um, and the same goes with our communities. We've had some, some really good discussions and we continue to have some processes that um, are very much associated with getting the right balance. Um, and so what I've put in that information report is um, some of the things that uh, we're required to do in getting together a, a new district plan. Um, so as you know, we, we took a, a draft out in March of a consolidated review. So basically everything's changed. And here's an opportunity for the community to see, okay, how does this look from a, um, a sustainable management perspective for the next 10 years for our district? How do we take into account all of these um, new responsibilities and balancing growth with protection? So it's a really, it's a, it's a difficult space, but it's a, a very great opportunity. Um, and so I've included in the information report just a, a grab of a few of the strong enabling components of the um, district plan, just so that we can see that um, whilst there are some um, difficult things that we're still working on, there are some strong responses to promoting housing, um, uh, enablement of Mary land, um, and responses to some of the, the risk issues that we face. So identifying new risk areas with new information um, so we can respond with, um, with uh, statutory uh, tools on, on climate change issues. So um, uh, just to recap, we've taken a draft issue plan out in March. We then have undertaken some targeted engagement because whilst everything has changed, some of those elements are quite new and challenging. And to put them into a, a proposed plan, we wanted to be sure that there was a, both awareness, um, understanding and feedback to our planning process so that we could, um, again, create a balance. So um, obviously the um, engagement on Indigenous biodiversity and the mapping of potential significant natural areas has a pro had a process um, and council has given us direction on that, on that process. And we're working on um, the, a new policy framework that uh, still achieves our higher order responsibilities without relying on the mapping of potential SNAs. More recently, we've um, undertaken um, engagement on potential heritage areas or suggested heritage areas. And that has been um, a discussion that um, would have been better to happen early in the year, but obviously due to some other um, issues, we've had to um, work within the parameters of, of, of what's workable. Um, and so we have now undertaken um, a very targeted engagement on that matter and staff are working on that res the responses to the feedback on the heritage engagement. Um, so just as a, a bit of a snapshot, um, we've had 126 responses to surveys, 145 free form email responses. Um, consequently, there's about 1,040 individual points that have been put forward in the feedback process that is really um, helpful and um, um, a, a necessary thing for the staff to evaluate to see well, what does the balance look like? Is there changes to the spatial extent? Is there changes to the policy framework? Um, is there changes to the regulatory versus the non-regulatory advocacy approaches? So that's what's happening at the moment. And we need to bring that back to our elected members to then test how, how do we progress that issue so that we can resolve it for notification of the proposed plan, which is not the end point, it's just the next step. Um, it's the next step to invite submissions. So we move then into a different space about um, testing the sustainable management um, approach in the proposed plan. Um, so really valuable. We appreciate um, the, the, um, the issues that it's raised with concern communities, and we still want to uh, very much uh, communicate with them on the next steps, but we're still working through what that looks like. Um, another topic that has influenced our time frame. Um, uh, sorry, I, I buried the lead. I should have mentioned at the beginning we were aiming to notify in the calendar year. So these are the things that have influenced why we are not doing that. Um, so um, the, the target date that we have for seeking council authorization is the Strategic Planning and Policy Committee, the 3rd of May. So coming back to those influences, um, uh, regional council are about to make available public um, to the public uh, region-wide flood mapping, which gives us updated flood mapping 
um, that replaces what was a non-statutory flood susceptible layer across the whole district. And that new updated mapping takes into account climate change in its modelling. So one of the directions that we have is to put updated coastal hazard mapping and flood mapping into our draft district plan. Whilst um, we have elements of that in the draft, we need to bring into play the new information and the data that sits behind it um, and evaluate what that means. So, um, for example, the updated flood mapping data will have information about the velocity and depth of flood risk in particular locations. Some of those locations might have zoned, been zoned in the draft for intensification. So we need to understand that risk so that we can make sure that we're not promoting something that could be a problem or inappropriate. So that's that's data that we thought was coming around about July. It's been now made available to us. Um, we've got, a, uh, I think, the end of this month. So, so that's a really important topic that will influence uh, some of the content in the, in the proposed plan. Um, and a very important process that is also continues, um, and that is our EWI engagement. So um, we are working as required um, with Tangana Whenua via our EWI authorities, um, and we're working on a program of um, seeking their, their feedback or their co consulting with EWI authorities to make sure that we both can listen to what has been um, advised and also reflect it in our policy framework and incorporate how we've responded into our um, evaluation reporting, which is a specific responsibility um, in the Resource Management Act. So these are really um, compelling and rich topics that continue to be worked on. Um, once we have um, developed that content, we wish to workshop it with our elected members. Um, and that will be a sequence of workshops that um, will bring to you the opportunity to become further aware of the options. And we then work together on the strategic direction to arrive at what is the, the sustainable management approach for a proposed plan, where then the community get to participate in a more kind of um, regular uh, channel approach than, than a, a, um, a draft plan. Um, yeah, so thank you for letting me take you through that very um, circuitous route to, to where we're at and where we want to be um, and how we seek to, um, to involve you in that process. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for that, Greg. And before I give the floor to Council of Usage, can I just acknowledge, uh, as you've raised, that this committee meeting would have ideally been the committee meeting that we uh, proposed that district plan. So uh, it's... It's an interesting day of emotions for everybody, I'm sure. Can I also just acknowledge, um, at the beginning of this term, I challenged our organisation to explore and define what agile bureaucracy might look like. And I think in a time of continuous shifting goalposts, I just want to commend your team for your continuous agility, I think. Um, I haven't seen goalposts shift at the rate that they shift. Uh, every everything that's related to this district plan. So thank you for your continuous mahi in that space. Council of Usage. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Greg, to your um, you and your team for all the good work they're doing. I, I really do appreciate it. I do have a question um, too, and that is, um, you've done a lot of work in all of this, and it would have been great to be able to um, yeah, go out and and bring it into practice, but unfortunately, uh, you know, some various delays. But my question really is, also, government is, is looking at centralisation of a lot of the planning functions, and I'm just concerned that all the effort and work you've done there, that we don't lose the good insights and so on. So that's one question to, for you to comment on. And the second one is uh, a number of those items listed in page 58, you'll see there, I've marked some of them, actually have a risk associated with them, which is not a surprise. For example, intensification of housing density would have a risk associated with it in terms of our infrastructure, supporting infrastructure. Uh, number nine, again, there, there's potential risks associated with that. Um, and 11, and that's the big one, the climate change mitigation adaption. Um, and you, you said that the flood um, hazard areas are coming out. And I do wonder 
you know, what impact that's going to be. There's a risk associated with it. For example, in some cases in a floodplain, do we do we actually build? Do we have the stomach to actually take heed of some of these things? And how do we respond? So, so the questions, those are the two questions. Um, with the centralisation that government's looking at, um, the work not be lost. I hope it's all be picked up on and that we can make it um, live. And number two, the uh, associated risks associated with some of those items. And, um, and I'm just thinking about their time for council to give consideration to that as we go ahead and, and implement some of these, these, these um, plan changes. The chair, thank you, Councillor Busic. Um, they're really good questions, and um, as um, just identified before, it's a really dynamic period, and to be undertaking a consolidated review against a backdrop of the extent of change offers um, opportunities and risks for sure. Um, the um, I, I think in the background, it's also good to recall that you know our communities haven't had the opportunity to. Um, participated in a consolidated review for a district plan since the early 2000s. Um, and lots has, lots has changed on the ground. There is a lot of demand for intensification and for affordable housing. And we have learned a lot more about the nature of risks and constraints. Um, and so um, advancing a proposed plan lets us participate not just for now, but also sets up a, a framework that can be um, easily transposed to a new um, framework. And that includes um, the natural and built environment plans that will be required under the Natural and Built Environment Act, um, where district councils will still be formulating content to go into a regional consolidated plan. And that process is gonna take some time. Um, and so, um, you know, we are we are basically fulfilling what will be required um, under new legislation. Um, if you think about it, is um, protection and enhancement of the natural environment and enablement of um, of housing and business land in urban environments. And so, the the, the balancing of those two things is the the the, um, the I guess the tricky part that central government's now working on with the, the creation of the new legislation. But there are, there's, there's strong messaging about, hey, it, there's, there's directions here that will be reinforced about um, biophysical bo bottom lines um, that need to be carried into plans. And so what we're doing with the proposed district plan is a step on that pathway and will allow for um, our communities to both um, be able to um, accelerate or be enabled to undertake appropriate development, but also do that development in places that are not going to result in risk or double down on um, some problems that we we may know about, but there's nothing in the statutory method that we can actually bring into play. Um, so I'm thinking of coastal hazard maps and, and river flood mapping. Making that very obvious will help um, guide uh, informed development and choice. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Foy. Thank you. So how long do I have, Madam Chair? I've got my <laughs> list here. You have five minutes, Councillor Foy. I am starting the timer. <laughs> so uh, my questions are, how many workshops are planned with elected members before May 2022? Um, we're looking at four workshops. Um, and how how long will they be? Considering that our last workshop about hazard planning, we spent about two hours on that and about six hours on climate change. Thank you. Yeah, really good point. And we're we're in the um, the process of seeking time, date, and um, and sequence allocation for those at the moment. Um, but the, the I would uh, suggest that apart from the workshops, we'd be happy to also incorporate briefing sessions leading up to the workshops so that we can get the most out of those um, opportunities. Um, so there's, you know, we, there's no surprises um, and there is also uh, a space to have informed discussion. 
Okay, um, thanks, Greg. Uh, five minutes. So my next question is to um, Andy, and I put it in the chat. It was about latent capacity. Um, I gave him a heads up. I was going to ask this question because it directly relates to subdivision and increased subdivision, and also um, increase in land use. It talks about tripling density. So if we're going to do that, uh, where is all of our three waters going to go? Um, so. In terms of the timing for the district plan, um, what asset management data will we have before then? Will we have a connections policy? Will we have updated public area of benefit maps? And will we have subdivision rules that reflect the tripling of density of land use rules? And will we be increasing our area of benefit, our current area of benefit, to allow for the 10 year time frame that our district plan is supposed to represent? See the chair, um, if I can answer in our, uh, the blunt answer to most of those questions, I know. Thank you. Um, I hope the elected members all heard that and alarm bells are all ringing for you because that is a significant risk to our district plan and to allowing growth or not. Um, and so without, yeah. Sorry. To the chair, you'll be aware, elected members will be aware that the LTP capital program is focused around keeping the lights on um, and there's very little new stuff, uh, new shiny stuff in the LTP. Um, it is a piece of work that we are doing at the moment and Councillor Foy is aware that we are doing some assessments around latent capacity across all our treatment plants and I've previously spoken to you to say that we have 60% um, confidence around what our headroom is. Clearly one of the issues that we need to be uh, aware of is allowing connections where there is insufficient headroom um, because effectively that will impact upon the level of service of um, existing customers. So it is a piece of work that is ongoing. It is related to program Darwin and there is a paper coming to council um, in December around requesting additional funding for program Darwin. But generally, this is a significant piece of work that will take a uh, more than just six months to to progress. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, as Greg said, that this is not a surprise. We've been doing this district plan, you know, since year 2000. So asset management shouldn't be a surprise to our council, particularly when planning for growth. I just think that we need to be realistic to the public if we don't have this information. And also, you know, that for whichever schemes they are, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, for all the schemes, which of the schemes with headroom or not, and how we're going to approach connections to allow for density or not um, for either subdivision or land use. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted all the elected members to be really aware of that because um, it's going to come up over and over again for our submissions and also in our appeals, I'm sure, for our district plan. Did you want to comment on that at all, Greg? Oh, thanks, Felicity. Um, look, I appreciate the points made, and um, um, I think there's a much more programmed approach that we are seeking to, to implement, um, and that is kind of uh, referenced in Section 31 of the Resource Management Act, basically says, work out what your demand is for housing and business land and put in place an integrated approach to supply for um, land, zone land and infrastructure. Um, so the district plan team's approach has, has looked at the infrastructure capacity. We haven't necessarily um, expanded intensification or, or zoned areas because of those limitations, but we've allowed for intensification within existing networked areas. That's our most efficient way to address our our headroom in terms of supply of demand um, and that also the intensification or compact urban form helps us achieve other outcomes such as um, minimizing vehicle kilometers traveled as a mitigation approach for uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, it also helps us um, get the benefits of density and work on how we get more well-functioning urban environments you know work on those connectivity issues so you know, working from the core outwards, I theoretically we should be able to create um, pathways for headroom from financial planning, infrastructure planning, and then achieve concentric growth outcomes, which is usually the most efficient and effective way to, um, to grow urban environments. 
Sorry, Felicity, on your, you're on mute, sorry. Thanks, Greg. I think the Chair might um, tell me I'm up with my question soon. Um, my last point was about flood hazard, not just flood hazard mapping from NRC, but we did ask that question about NRC when they did the presentation. How have they mapped it? Is it based on the permitted baseline in the district plan or is it based on the existing coverage of impermeable services currently? And how has that been approached in terms of our, not just our consenting, but our building consents? Um, and I will note that you didn't um, detail that we will have all new land use rules for, for flood hazards and our district plan, we've never had those. So not only we need a building consent with um, an engineer and port for hazards for your building consent, you will need to apply for a resource consent as well, which will increase every single person's cost for anyone in one of those blue areas on the new NRC maps. Thank you. Yes, in fact, um, that framework is already in the draft. Um, what's what's happening as a result of the new information is that we'll have um, different maps um, that will describe the 1 in 10 and 1 in 100 flood risk. Um, and there will be associated triggers in the district plan already there, but it will be referencing the new spatial extent of those areas. Um, so the flood risk issue um, is, and the maximum probable development approach in the modelling. Um, so basically uh, the question is, does the modelling take into account a impermeable surface under the operative plan? So for example, 15% for rural production has been um, developed and informing that model uh, or 100 percent for a commercial and industrial area um, the answer we don't know yet and we're actually um, engaging with a specialist to help us work out um, the risks um, associated with intensification not just with spatial extent but also with um, flood depth and velocity so you know you may have a, a, a flood mapped area that has an overland flow it's not so much of a risk but if it's a head high, high velocity flood outcome, it's not something that you want to be intensifying. So so that's the, the piece of information that will inform whether we rationalise some of our upzoned areas um, and change perhaps some of the policy framework. So that's, it's, it's quite an important piece of work, um, but it, it won't necessarily be the end point when we notify, it then it is inviting submissions and it will be further refined as a result. Thank you. Thank you for that, Greg, and thank you for that, Councillor Foy. I did allow extra time, but you did kindly put your questions one at a time to Greg as opposed to uh, barraging them in the five minutes. So uh, I'm sure that he appreciates that as well. I uh, Just as the chair of the committee, obviously some eyebrows were raised uh, in regards to the response to the infrastructure yeah. capacity question. And I think that there is a need for us to continue that conversation with urgency. Uh, outside of this committee, committee meeting. So I'll be raising that with our CEO as to how we move forward with that. Uh, I have Councillor Stratford next. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. I just want to um, raise that, um, firstly, at my Three Waters portfolio, you know, this is this is something that staff are working on, but I think we need to give them um, the opportunity to reply with a more formed response. Um, where was my note? What the heck was I talking about? I want to ask Greg if he mentioned um, Tangata Whenua engagement with iwi authorities and a number of uh, marae trustees have got in touch um, wanting to invite you know the DP team there when when their marae is open to talk with them and I, I just I know we've had the conversation in the past about not having enough resource to get around everywhere but have we have we got there are we going to be able to um, speak to uh, mana whenua you know on the marae before we even attempt to put together a proposed plan? Um, the door is always open and um, we, we're, I guess we are working through the iwi authorities, which, which is the statutory requirement um, to then see how they best want to work with their, with their hapu. 
um, or Takiwa, perhaps, and to see how we can then um, listen to those voices and, and, get, and take into account that feedback. Um, now, ideally, you know, we we uh, we would be at every marae, um, you know, to, to talk about this. We we want it to be um, first of all aware of what the offering is, so that people can see the, the, the challenges and the enablement that is being pre presented. Um, creating those opportunities for narratives and stories is is a challenge, um, and so I think um, whilst we were a following that process, we will always be open to having um, opportunities to, to meet on Marae. That's the best part of the job. Yeah, the um, provisions of the RMA aren't limited to um, iwi, though. Correct, correct. Um, it's Tangata Whenua through iwi authorities, and so that's a, it's a very uh, liberal um, opportunity. Um, and so, yeah, I think... Um, the answer is always yes. It's just it will be constrained given the time and the resource that we that we do have. So if there's opportunities to to maximise those opportunities, you know, um, you know, through through coalescing or amalgamation yeah. of hui, then. Thank you, Greg. And given the challenges that we have with uh, potentially being in a red um, COVID protection framework, um, will we be you know, that may push back the ability to have authentic engagement with our um, iwi and hapu. It, it offers a different kind of uh, platform and how do you maximise that opportunity? I guess we, we tested that with our heritage area, um, Digital Hui, um, which uh, I, you know, you could measure a success or a challenge depending on the perspective, I think. Um, being able to have um, open opportunities for people to talk to us um, is challenging in a COVID situation, you know, mm. both for for groups of people and for staff. So um, we're, I guess we're in a different environment. Um, we're, we're keen to utilise what is the best, most practicable and safe methods to allow for participation. And perhaps that issue carries through in um, in hearings. You know, so that's a different type of engagement once the plan is notified, submissions, further submissions, and then hearings. And so we're thinking about how do we equitably and efficiently allow for people, um, submitters, to um, to participate in that forum. Yeah. I, I just need to express my um, concern over the potential to, um, you know, f do further engagement on digital platforms, particularly with um, the marae that have contacted me, they don't even have, um, you know, broadband out out there, so they wouldn't be able to participate. So um, I, my desire is to still have um, some face to face, and I know that um, some of the parties from uh, Russell, Kurirua, and Monganui that raised raised concerns about heritage areas. They they still want an opportunity to have face to face as well, um, and I I just want to close by commenting that um, what a beast you've had, um, Greg. You know, we this organisation doesn't have a very good um, reputation as a trusted organisation. So you you already you know fighting a losing battle. I, I'm sorry to be so cynical, teammates, but um, so you're trying, you are trying to, I know that you are trying to do some good here. You are following the legislative framework that's, you know, been given down by the Crown. And um, then we get a flipping pandemic and a lot of people are in denial about how much that actually affects our ability to do our job, let alone your job. Um, and I just want to acknowledge how stressful this has been. I don't think anybody envisaged this district plan uh, being um, as challenging as 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 it is. And um, I know that you've had to bear some personal stuff, and you 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 know whack it off the whole team. But I've been in the room with some of those who, and um, especially that heritage one and Russell. Uh, 
everyone's very passionate about um, the work that they had already put in to the prior um, district plan and they you know a lot of people just want to hold on to something you know they want to hold on to what they know they fought for um, but yeah I, I I know we've got a ways to go and I look forward to hearing um, the detailed analysis um, I even do want to read some you know want to read the hard copies I don't just want an analysis um, yeah cool thank you Thank you, Vote. Can I just respond um, through the chair? Um, can I just uh, say, say thank you for that? Um, the team have been um, fully engaged um, in the process from the beginning, fully invested, and um, and it does become a personal and emotional kind of investment as well. And we appreciate all of the support from our elected members in what has been a very challenging year. But it's also an important discussion with our communities. Um, these are happening for good reasons. Um, we haven't had a review of the plan holistically since the early 2000s. The game has changed and it's necessary to, to test it, to create awareness. I, I think we've got good awareness. I mean, I'm still surprised when people say, I didn't know about your draft district plan. Um, I was like, really? Um, so, um, you know, that's part of this exercise is to create a profile, get people aware get them involved so they can participate. It's the last time they're going to get this level of participation in plan making. So that's really important. So thank you. Thank you for that, Greg. I've got Deputy Mayor Court and then Councillor Clendon. I'm going to change my approach because I'm just a little bit concerned about something my previous, the previous speaker said, quote, this organisation does not have a good reputation as a trusted organisation. And I think that was harsh. And I think that was unfair. And that leads into my question. And my question is around what governance comfort can I take that we're actually going to have a district plan because the government is changing the rules. And our organisation is trying to respond to the rules. And as a regulator uh, in, in giving effect to government policy, uh, we have to dance to their tune. And while that may create a sense of distrust in the public, um, I, I think that that's a pretty harsh uh, comment to state in a public meeting in regard to the Far North District Council. But I want to come back to the report where it says council has a legal obligation to have a district plan. And the law says we have to review this every 10 years. And this process commenced in the year 2000 and it's now the year 2021 at the end of. And I'm being asked today to receive a report which seeks to push out the timeline yet again. And if we're looking for Nirvana, if we're looking for a point in time where the rules coming out of Wellington change or stop, that's never going to happen. So at some point in time, we're going to have to say, this is where we draw the line in the sand and we write a district plan. And we cannot sit here endlessly waiting for more flood hazard maps or a new government position on climate change or a new government position on RMA reform or a new government position on housing density, we will never get to have a district plan if that is always the case. Yes, Greg, you talked about opportunities and risks, but it goes both ways. The fact that we don't have a, a district plan that has been changed in 30 years means that we don't have a district plan that's adapted to the environment that we live in today. And we need to at some point in time say the old district plan is no longer fit for purpose. The current district plan might not meet where we think the government's going, but it's going to do for now. So I have a question. What are other authorities doing? Because they're all in the same position that we are. Their district plans might be in different stages of development. But is it normal that other authorities take 30 or longer years to complete a statutory process? And what governance comfort can I take as an elected member 
that we're going to have an operative district plan that's achieving compliance with the law and not be put in this position in 12 months time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Council Court and through the Chair. Um, some really good questions and reflecting the, um, the dynamic and very compelling legal landscape around us. Um, perhaps if I could just get in the time machine, go back a few years. Um, the, the operative district plan has been subject to around 20 individual plan changes that have tweaked it, changed it, changed direction, actually improved some of its functionality and risks, especially around uh, rural environments. Um, some of our direction, though, um, was necessary to kind of consolidate, and that was primarily through the regional policy statement being made operative in 2016. That created um, a bunch of uh, new responsibilities that were prescribed to council to, to implement in a district plan. And so a consolidated review of the district plan was commenced in 2016. So that is within the 10 year period of the operative plan. So we're, we're on the right statutory time frame. We, we're on the right train tracks, if you like. The making of the district plan is also, I guess it's rather than being just a, a least change approach to the operative plan, it has bundled in um, many of the things that our council has asked for in the past, you know, moving from an effects-based plan to a much more activities-based plan that's been aided by um, enforced to by national planning standards. So not only do we create a new district plan, we have to adhere to a new template for that plan. And some of the content of that plan is also mandatory and standardized. So um, we've shifted from a very liberal effects based plan to an E plan with some mandatory content and that E plan has to look like the rest of the country. Um, the, the the content of the plan is also being shifted in terms of here's the national direction that you have to put into place. So biodiversity is a good example of strong um, milestones in identifying um, the, uh, the extent of our significant Indigenous vegetation, but also putting in measures to manage that in the vegetation. It's a statutory responsibility. Um, and so there are from our perspective, we, we've had to bring our community with us in this process of bundling up a brand new plan that serves the purpose of what the National Planning Standard is asking us, but also the issues that are very unique to our district. We're not really comparable to anywhere else in terms of our natural capital, our natural heritage, um, and the dispersed nature of our urban environment and a low funding base to, to improve upon um, affordable housing and development. So it's a very complex equation to deal with. Um, I, I, I totally um, understand your concerns about knocking issues out again, um, but I'd suggest we're at the pretty much the 11th hour of the, of the draft content. There is time needed to integrate where the plan lands into an e-plan format. It's no longer just Here's a paper document with a plan. This is an integrated digital plan that works um, across the plan. So you can pick a parcel and all of that, the policies and methods are assembled for that parcel. It's a different product to what we've had to work with at all before. And so there is quality assurance and integration measures that are necessary once we're comfortable with what a proposed looks like. And so those that, that machinery, if you like, and getting a the document ready to be able to be shared again, because what the proposed look like will not be the same as what a draft looks like. It has been influenced by the feedback that we have, that we continue to have. It is evolving. And then the proposed plan will also change again. So um, um, if um, the, the, the new legislation, whilst there's repeal and replacement at the end of next year, it's going to take up to 10 years, legal advice is that it's going to take up to 10 years to be able to be ready to be presented in a brand new format. Now, during that period, there'll be many different types of repackaging and assembling of, of um, uh, natural and built plans. 
But by landing this content, it makes that process much easier and represents a community outcome to then allow for that transition. So it's, it's not necessarily a putting a handbrake on everything because all these things are contributing to the new direction that we're looking at and we can see the value that is being promoted here. Um, yeah, so um, I'm not sure if I've sufficiently answered your, your question, Councillor Corp, but I'm happy to take on any further questions or um, refinement. Councillor Court, would you like the opportunity to respond or are you happy to take that offline? No, Madam Chair, I'll be outside of standing orders. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Court. I have Councillor Clendon. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, a lot of the, my points have been discussed. I won't dwell on them. Just three quick points, I guess. Just to highlight, this is probably one of the more important district plan processes, simply because it'll be the last district plan we ever write. If this government gets its way, which it seems it will, district plans will disappear into these um, 30 year regional spatial strategies. And I confess I was appalled yesterday to hear that MFE, the minister, is seriously considering whether or not there should be any elected members sitting on these joint committees that will write and approve these 30 year regional strategies. Um, I, that's, I mean, David Parker has a reputation as something of a technocrat, but that's going beyond the pale in my view to suggest you just put a bunch of expert planners and engineers and what have you around a table and determine what our community is going to look like for the next 30 years. That's abhorrent for me, so I think we have to push really hard at every opportunity to say no. Sitting within that, obviously, whatever's embedded in the district plans that are current or that will be current when we have the transition, they will undoubtedly inform the regional spatial strategies because you can't start with a clean piece of paper. Inevitably, what we embed in this plan will in some shape or form influence the RSS when we get to that point. So it is an important document. Um, I guess, yeah, John and others have raised what I see as a, a disconnect between some of the aspirations around intensification and our ability to fund the infrastructure that will enable that. In my own backyard, Kitty Kitty, you know, there's a, there's a debate about the capacity of wastewater. Um, the water supply we know is not as robust as it ought to be. And obviously roading is already inadequate. And those three, just those three fundamental things, I don't believe could accommodate a tripling of residential capacity, even over a 10 year plan. So I think we have got a significant um, disconnect there. My only other point, um, and Greg touched on it, the notion you know, that this new draft plan will be an e-plan. I think we have to, and I've, I mean, this is probably people sick of hearing this, the same old comment that um, we have to be very clear, or very certain that members of the public have access to this draft plan so that they can make sensible submission to it. To suggest that somebody with perhaps with a wobbly Wi-Fi connection and a sort of 10 year old um, desktop computer will be able to navigate through the e-plan in a way that is meaningful for them. We need to be very clear or very um, sure that we're providing access points and that people who may not be particularly technically literate or to have the necessary equipment or skills can nevertheless understand what's intended in the plan and to be able to respond to it. Um, yeah, those are the only three points I wanted to make. Thank you, Councillor Clendon. Councillor Tippenham. Good, thank you, Chair Smith. Um, just a couple of things for me, I guess um, just in response to um, Councillor Stratford's comments and to maybe contextualise some of them um, in regards to our reputation. Yeah, a lot of um, reputational things for us is not our fault at all. But I think that um, to contextualise what she was saying, it was in regards to Iwi and Hapu and how we're engaging with them. And um, while we, we know how that went with significant natural areas and we had thousands of our residents march upon our Kaikui headquarters. So that did do some damage to our reputation as a, as a council in this space. But also we, we're still, we're still 
recovering from 180 years of colonization. So there are going to be any government department, no matter what color your department is or, or what your emblem is, if you're anything to do with the government, I'm, I'm afraid we're going to continually have reputational issues and we're just going to have to work through that as we grow as a country. Um, but in regards to simply only having online um, engagement for our iwi hapu or whomarai, I, I do want to um, support Councillor Stratford's uh, comments there. I, I think, Greg, I remember our, my very first year as a councillor, I saw a video from um, Hakatumarai, Nelson City, where they were doing some engagement on their district plan. And I wish we had just a tiny little area that only had like one iwi and two marae in it, and we could do something cool like that. But I think I shared that video with you and I said, hey, are we going to do anything like this? That looks pretty cool. And you said, yeah, that we are going to look to do things like that. And it looked really cool. We've also had cousin COVID come along since then. And um, I also remember when we were post COVID, we we're looking at how to cut our budgets for our residents. Um, there was the request there from district planning for 200 odd K to be able to realize to the full extent what we wanted for our people. And all of the teething issues and at times they feel like growing a new um, wisdom tooth or um, a tooth that needs to be pulled in the middle of the night when you're up and you're in pain are actually I wear that because I know that we had these requests come through to governance, but we were trying to save our district and our residents money. So we had to go for um, different options or looking at it. So I do wear that, but if, we, if there is opportunity there, Greg, for us to um, have some face to face engagement, even in key locations, or if it were a few of our marae who we know um, have more active hapu, then I'd very much be there to support and I know so would Councillor Stratford. Um, I don't know, I I lost my train of thought now, but um, we're almost there um, <laughs> for our very last district plan. Um, whatever it takes, let's find our way there along this ride. Kia ora. Kia ora, Councillor Tepania. I don't have any hands raised, so I'm going to jump in and take my very quick opportunity. So the first point I want to make to the committee is just in response to the presentation we had from Janine Smith at MFE yesterday. And I want to commend Councillor Foy for holding uh, her feet to the fire from a local perspective. There was an invitation raised from Janine uh, for phone conversations and this morning Darren and I have spoken about picking that invitation up and inviting Janine to come and sit with the committee and staff to ensure that we get a collaborative message going through to MFE so that we can make sure that we can give ourselves governance comfort, uh, Councillor Court to your point because I hear what you're saying, give ourselves governance comfort that we will strike this district plan. We have to ensure that at a local level we hold the reins in this space we have the ability to ensure that that district plan lands and we have to not lose sight of that. Um, I just want to take a moment. Uh, I think everybody knows how much I love uh, a good post-it note and there are always post-it notes in front of me. And at the moment, about 20% of my post-it notes uh, are Greg quotes uh, and it actually is titled, they are titled Greg quotes. Uh, so the gem that Greg gave me last week is the district plan is the strongest tool we have in our toolbox to address climate change. Uh, I think in response, Councillor Foy, you stole my, my question, so I appreciate you putting the capacity question up. Uh, what I've learned recently is that territorial authorities and regional th authorities through the RMA, and Greg, forgive me if I quote the wrong section, but I think it's sections 30 and 31, require um, that we have to allow supply, sufficient supply for housing and business. And I think that response to the capacity question and to get another post-it note down is a prime example of how this council has been planning in silos for too long. And that brings me back to the opening statements that I made to this committee this morning about us taking the reins back and ensuring that we are no longer planning in silos. So our three key mechanisms in this space, land use planning, financial planning and infrastructure planning. And we have the opportunity to make sure that we get this right because we cannot any longer continue to let our inability to respond to capacity needs dictate the lack of housing and our housing supply and business supply. We need to take the own narrative back. We need to tell our own story. So committee, this is our focus for next year. We're going to take back that narrative and we're going to give ourselves governance comfort in this space. 
because that's what we were elected to do. I think those are probably my comments. I'll leave it at this point. So, Councillor Vucic, I will give you your right of reply and then we will bring this item to a close. I'm trying to get off mute. You, you muted yourself, Councillor. You're back on mute. I can reply. <laughs> Second up. Oh, here he goes. Am I am I free now? Can you hear me? This computer is responding very slowly. I think I pushed it three times and it cycled through the mute and unmute three times. No, I'm good. Thank you for all that. You shouldn't have waited. Thank you, Councillor. Madam Chair, can I make a comment about what you've just said? Just uh, one. one sorry, Councillor Foy, I'm really aware that we've got three minutes until we are supposed to break understanding orders, so I'd really like to get the last item no done. I'm sure that there's opportunity for offline conversation following this. And I muted myself. The recommendation in front of us after a robust uh, debate is that the Strategy and Policy Committee receive the report completion of the draft district plan and timetable for notification. Moved by Councillor Vucic, seconded by Councillor Foy. I am in favour. Councillor Clendon. In favour. Deputy Mayor Court. Opposed. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Foy. In favour. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Tipania. In favour. Councillor Vucic. Connectivity issues, I think, for Councillor Vucic. Member Ward. Aye. Councillor Vucic, perhaps if you could just pop up your hand if you're in favour of receiving. Thank you. Uh, that is passed. Deputy Mayor Court, would you like your vote against recorded? It is by default, Madam Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Court. So I'm aware that we've got one minute understanding orders, but with the committee's uh, agreeance, I would like to get us through this last uh, item of 6.3, which is simply the action sheet. Do I have any opposition to that? Excellent. So the recommendation in front of us is that the Strategy and Policy Committee receive the report action sheet update November 2021. I am happy to move. Do I have a seconder, please? Happy to Councillor. second. Thank you, Councillor Tepania. Uh, Darren, I'm not sure that there are any comments on this outside just acknowledging that there are perhaps some items that could be closed uh, in relation to bylaws, which would be great. If you've got any further comments, otherwise I'll open the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That 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 would be my advice as well. We need to um, we need to be cognizant of the timeliness of updating the action sheet so that it remains relevant. So we'll have that ready for February. Fantastic. Thank you, Darren. Councillor Tipania, a seconder. Do you have any comments or questions? No, I only seconded to get my name in the minutes. Kia ora. <laughs> Councillor Stratford, the floor is yours. I don't know whether I've been in the cave, but I just wondered, um, did we have a workshop on the private water supplies options for the provision of water tanks before November 2021? Is it scheduled? No. OK, so maybe we just need an update on that. I'm happy to take that offline, Councillor Stratford, and pick that up for an update. Thank next, you. Next year's fine. <laughs> so busy. <laughs> Thank you for that, Steer. Uh, I don't have any other hands up, so speak now or forever hold your peace. No, I am in favour of receiving the report. Councillor Clendon. Aye. Uh, Deputy Mayor Court. Aye. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Foy. Favour. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Tiffany. Aye. Councillor Vucich. Aye. Member Ward. Aye. And that is passed.
Thank you, everybody, for a fantastic committee meeting. I think uh, what today has highlighted for me, especially in terms of the district plan, is the sheer amount of time that elected members need to ensure that they are getting that comfort in that space. So I think that that's a conversation that we need to continue as to how we ensure that with our agenda items and make sure that we're allowing enough time to give the district plan the priority that it needs. Um, I know that I was quite loose on standing orders, but it was important to me that everybody was given the opportunity to ask the questions and have those answered, also in a transparent process uh, to the public as well. So thank you, everybody, for uh, for your energy today. It's quite exciting to be finishing a strategy and policy committee meeting at 11.32 a.m. So we will take that for the win and you can gain a couple of hours of your day before infrastructure meets this afternoon. Darren, thank you as always to you and your team for your really active participation. Um, I really appreciate the way that our committee is working with your team uh, to achieve some really good outcomes. And I feel good about 2022. So. Bring it on before those elections next year, hey? So on that note, everybody, I will close us with a karakia. Please go and enjoy the day. Get outside and get some fresh air. Enoi tato. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa punamu te moana. Hei huarahi ma tato i te rangi nei. Aroha atu, aroha mai. Tato i tato katoa. Hui e, tai ki e.